Thank you. So as we go through this panel and, and we're going to talk about the differences and similarities between the UK, the US, the EU and, and the Canadian Act, I think there's sort of two main things we can sort of think about and take away from this. One is that obviously Canadian entities, organizations, corporations uh, need to be as aware of the UK and the US legislation uh, as they are of the Canadian legislation. And, and secondly, uh, I think we can look, because we're still in our infancy, we talked about uh, Mark and the United States as Big Brother, we can look to the United States in particular uh, for guidance and, and instruction on, on some of the particulars of the Act and, and where and how those might be interpreted. Uh, so uh, if we can just start by looking at the key features of the Acts, um, we've already heard and so I won't go through again uh, the key features of the Canadian Act. You, you've heard it's a very simple piece of legislation. Uh, there's a lot of similarities uh, between it and sort of the basic uh, foreign corruption aspect of the FCPA. Uh, but uh, let's talk about first, if I can, Jonathan, uh, talk about the, the new UK legislation and uh, focusing on some of the breadth of that legislation and, and how, again, Canadian organizations may want to take note. Yeah, happy to. And uh, thanks, uh, Mark and Glenn, for those introductions. And thanks, uh, Sandra and her team, for giving me the opportunity to come and speak uh, here from so far away. As is customary when anyone from uh, England comes to Canada, I send you the Queen's best wishes. Uh, <coughs> and I thank God, particularly on behalf of Will and Kate, for the Mounty hats. <laughs> um, they're... Um, I think the UK legislation is still bedding down and it would be great to say that the legislation is only two pages long, uh, however that would be untrue. Um, the legislation itself is complex and it's made more complicated by the political background behind the legislation. The legislation passed under what's called the wrap-up, which is an obscure uh, old English thing, maybe Canada inherited it, where the outgoing administration discusses with the other main political parties what is left on its legislative program at the end of the parliament and whether any of it should be killed or has life and can be passed in the last 48, 72 hours. So the bribery legislation was part of the wrap-up and how that played out was that three senior politicians from each of the three major parties sat in a dark room and worked out which bits of the legislation could survive. And as part of that political compromise, the Ministry of Justice, which is completely different to the Department of Justice, Ministry of Justice is, the, if you like, the legislative arm rather than the prosecutor, uh, the, the Ministry of Justice was empowered to issue uh, guidance notes for this particular um, uh, new section that I'll discuss in a minute. And so we have, as well as the legislation itself, we have these very long uh, guidance notes which interpret section 7, uh, as I say, considerably more than uh, two pages there. And in addition, we have uh, joint prosecution guidelines as well, which are maybe another 12 pages. And then in addition, we have a memorandum to judges on enforcement. So we are killing trees, which is maybe good news for the Canadian forestry industry. Um, I, I would say that there are seven major differences between the uh, F FCPA. There are obviously similarities with Canada, um, and maybe I'll run through those quickly if we call them my uh, magnificent seven. Um, the, the first is that public and private bribery uh, is prosecuted. So we're not, uh, we are interested in public officials, but that's not the long and the short of it. Private to private corruption, one corporation bribing another is within the ambit of the Act. The second is that it is not better to give than to receive. Giving and receiving are both criminalised. And indeed, the first prosecution is for receipt of a bribe, not for giving one. The Munia Patel case, which is briefly summarised in the uh, background paper that you have. The third uh, area, I think, that's uh, very different, uh, again, being talked about already this morning, facilitation payments. No defence facilitation payments under the UK legislation. 
the prosecutors think that facilitation payments are the first act in a bribery play, and they think that facilitation payments should be stopped. There are common law exemptions, just as we discussed this morning, broadly uh, similar uh, uh, looking. Um, additionally, we have a new offence uh, of failure to prevent bribery. There is a defence to that new offence of failure to take, uh, where you can say that you put reasonable measures in place. But effectively, that's a switched burden. And that's an, as unusual in the UK as it is uh, for Canada, I think. We very rarely reverse the burden, but effectively, if an act of bribery takes place, it will be up to the corporation to prove that they did everything that they could for that not to have happened. And I personally think that's a really high bar. You know, obviously, for you to be facing that offence, something happened. So, given that hindsight's a wonderful thing, I think it'll be very difficult to prove that you took all reasonable measures. And that's strictly what the Ministry of Justice guidance is all about. That's the compromise when the legislation came in. Next, a slightly obscure thing, but I've reviewed maybe 20, 25 FCPA policies uh, in the run-up to the new UK legislation coming in. And one of the things that screams to me is that the Ministry of Justice and the a serious fraud officer who will be the prosecutor, but by the way, we don't have a trivial fraud office, we don't have a comical fraud office, we just, we just make do with the one serious one. Um, <laughs> and, uh, so, but, but one of the things that's screaming out to me, bizarrely, is language. A lot of the FCPA policies I see, and, and I don't wish to insult particularly Mark, and I don't wish to insult US attorneys in, uh, in general. Go ahead. But <laughs> um, they're written in this obscure uh, legalistic language that people maybe spoke in England in the 16th century. And oh, you clearly haven't read the ones I've written. Obviously, <laughs> which are in clear English. I'm looking okay. forward to that. Yeah. Um, but but that seems to be one of the real yeah. bugbears. That you know, I'm a a reasonably qualified attorney, and I frankly struggle to read what some FCPA policies are, um, are trying to say. And, and despite my accent, my native language is English. And, um, and to say that you can say, given that it's a reversed burden, that somebody in pick a jurisdiction who doesn't speak good English can get to the heart of what that is trying to say, I think is ridiculous, and I think people will lose their defence on language alone in FCPA policies. And so a lot of the work I've been doing is translating the policy, if you like, from American mm -hmm. to English. Um, <laughs> uh, penalties are different, where 10 years are in jail versus 5. And then the other thing that I wanted to spend some time on, because it's been a particular bugbear of mine and, and, and uh, I made some written submissions on this, is hospitality. So hospitality and gifts are both within uh, the purview of the UK legislation. Now, originally, the Ministry of Justice was talking a very tough game on this. It may be influenced by the fact that um, UK public officials don't get to go on trips anywhere. Um, but, um, uh, and, and that's been watered down to an extent. Uh, there are political reasons why it's been watered down. Um, but it seems to me that hospitality is still a big issue. It's a particular issue this year, I think, because of the Olympics. Uh, if anyone's interested in that, I've tried to write another paper, which I'm happy to send you, on why I think the, uh, you know, the, the coming together of the Bribery Act and the Olympics poses challenges for a lot of multinational corporations. But basically, um, we don't know where the bar is on hospitality. We know that reasonable and justified hospitality is probably okay. We know that lavish hospitality is not okay. But for some industries, it's very difficult to know what lavish is. And also, it seems to me that it is likely that if this were to come before any jury, almost anything we do, and I, I, I don't, you know, I'm pro-hospitality. If anyone wants to offer it, I'm still accepting. But, um, but it seems to me that, that we have uh, I don't want to speak for the other three, but we have probably different ideas of what's lavish versus the person who sits on a jury. We've had particular issues in the UK over the type of people who sit on juries in long fraud trials. Bluntly, they're people in the main who might be retired.
who might be...